wasn't until last year that there was a formal definition for scoping reviews. Why was there a need? Well, you've, you've got the answer right there in the question. Uh, a lot of people define scoping reviews in many different ways and sometimes they cover different types of approaches within their definition for scoping reviews. So there was a lot of confusion and a lot of people doing scoping reviews for perhaps the wrong reason. So as a JBI scoping review methodology group, we thought, well, let's try to end this confusion in the field. Let's actually sit together, try to come up with a definition, and then hopefully uh, people will be doing scoping reviews for the right reasons. Excellent, so it's to help uh, improve the clarity in the field for us. Yeah, that's right. So we're hoping that with this formal guidance, this formal definition, people will be able to choose when to do a scoping review or not. Uh, because, as we said, historically, there's been a lot of confusion in this field. Can you um, tell us the definition on, and break it down for us? I certainly can. So after much deliberation and through a consensus approach with this JBI scoping review methodology group, we ended up with the following definition. Scoping reviews are a type of evidence synthesis that aim to systematically identify and map the breadth of evidence available on a particular topic, field, concept or issue, often irrespective of the source, so primary research reviews or non-empirical evidence. These can be done within or across particular contexts. Scoping reviews can clarify key concepts, definitions in the literature and identify key characteristics or factors related to a concept including those related to methodological research. Excellent. Now, it's really interesting because scoping reviews are known for their mapping. Um, so we're adding now things like identifying concepts and characteristics. Why was there a need for that? Well, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question as well. And once again, scoping reviews have, have historically, they've been, they've been described as being able to map the evidence. But they can do much more than that. It's not just about mapping the evidence. You can also investigate the evidence or the literature in front of you as well, including things like looking at what are the various definitions for particular concepts. And in the past, there weren't these rigorous approaches to do that, but scoping reviews provide an excellent framework to actually investigate how definitions are used in the field for particular concepts, um, and then perhaps inform a, a uniform or universal definition as well. And the same goes for the other areas as well. They're great at looking at how research can be conducted uh, and different methodological as aspects of research and to clarify these key concepts also. So they go beyond mapping. I think that's a, a misunderstanding of scoping reviews that they just do mapping. They can go beyond that as well. Yeah, so this is really um, an invigorating approach to scoping reviews if we think it's going beyond any original understanding of it before. Well, I think so. Well, I mean, scoping reviews have been around for 20 odd years now. And, you know, there, there, there's a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of different guidance and different ways that have been used now, sometimes appropriately and sometimes inappropriately. And what we're trying to clarify in this definition is the ways that scoping reviews can be used appropriately, such as mapping the evidence, such as clarifying key concepts in the field, such as clarifying definitions or, or concepts related to a particular topic. Um, and investigating methodological issues as well. These are the reasons we see scoping reviews as appropriate. Um, we've tried to distinguish when scoping review methodology shouldn't be used, such as when you're trying to, uh, when you should be doing a systematic review of an intervention or a systematic review of effectiveness, for example. And all of that's boiled down into in this new definition which, which we've proposed. Yeah. So I suppose when we think about scoping reviews and I think about researchers that have never done a scoping review before and have just been introduced to it. What do you hope this definition can do and how do you want them to apply it? Well, I hope, hopefully, when people find this definition, it'll be a good starting point for them on their journey of finding the right evidence synthesis approach for them. And as perhaps PhD students or, or early researchers or even people who are just new to a field of evidence synthesis, sometimes it can be hard to actually figure out, well, what approach should I be using? And hopefully this definition of scoping reviews is one of the signposts along the way, which they can use to inform their eventual choice. Excellent. So where else and what else should a new scoping reviewer access if they're starting their first scoping review? This scoping review definition, it was developed by the JBI Scoping Review Methodology Group. And within the JBI Scoping Review Methodology Group, we've spent a lot of time and a lot of years developing robust guidance for scoping reviews. So you can actually access our manual, our JBI Scoping Reviews manual in the JBI Manual for Evidence Synthesis. 
We've also developed training resources as well. So we have a course, a one-day uh, workshop for how to do scoping reviews, and that's, that's, that's delivered here in Adelaide, but also by our groups around the globe. Another really useful resource, which uh, was developed by some members of the JBI Scoping Review Methodology Group, but an even broader international um, consortium, is the Prisma SER, which is the reporting standard for scoping reviews as well. And if you're starting off doing a scoping review, these are, these are really the places you should check out. Excellent.